Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Nashville Tour Stop Podcast. Thanks for tuning in this week. Across the table from me is pal of mine and best hairline in the house. We've got Mr. Hunter Taylor. <coughs> hey, guys. <I'm- laughs> That little bourbon's a little stronger than I thought it was going to be. Yep, we're sipping on, uh, well, this is not the bottle. I just threw it away. We just polished it off, but we're sipping Belmead Reserve, which is 109 proof. Dang, for real? Yep. I can't even count that high. (laughs) High test bourbon, man. That's right. Thanks for tuning in this week. Man, how are you? Dude, I'm doing great. You know, I'm staying really busy. Yep. We got a lot of, October is really packed up with a lot of music stuff, and it's very exciting for us, and uh, it's keeping me and my boys pretty busy. Cool. And, uh, you know, with music, we're busy. I work full-time during the week building industrial sewing machines, and then uh, I also drive pedal taverns on the weekend. Should we cut out the shits, too? Oh, it don't matter to me, man. (laughs) Yeah, well... (laughs) It don't matter if you say it, and my mom ain't gonna get mad at me for you saying it. All right, no, that's, we'll that's just keep fine. that in mind. <laughs> I just got to be sure I tame my tongue <laughs> because I don't want the wrath of Donna Taylor upon me, my friend. Hi, Donna. Hi, Mama Taylor. Say hello to her. Be nice to her. She's <laughs> she's sweet, but she's also very scary at the same time. Where'd you grow up? Oh, uh, here in Nashville. You're a local. Well, yeah. So I grew up in a town called Fairview, Tennessee. It's okay. about thirty minutes west of here, and uh, that's where all of my people come from. Okay. Uh, my parents were on the same t-ball team out there, and uh, true story, um, they say that my dad's grandfather owned a liquor store, and my mom's grandfather kept him in business. He's like, Get that bottle, son. And uh, that's that's true fact. There's pieces of our family we can't even trace outside of Fairview. Damn. So uh, we've been out there for a very long time, and then when I was in uh, probably about the seventh grade, going in the seventh grade, we moved up to... Uh, in the Creve Hall area in Nashville and uh, started going to Lipscomb. Gosh, dang. And I went there from middle school through college. So I'm not a lifer, but I'm a most of my life. Most of your lifer. Mm-hmm. Man, I yeah. had no idea. Oh, yeah. I just assume most of the people who move here are like transplants. Right. Because, right. I mean, I am. Will is. Our mm-hmm. producer, Will, shout out. What but- up, Will? <laughs> Yep. Slick mustache, dude. Dude, he does have a sick mustache. I wish I could grow a mustache that I've good. I've let my, my scruff grow out a little bit. Mm-hmm. You know, just deer season's coming up, man. I, you know, this old pale face of mine really sticks out to them white tails. <laughs> so I'm trying to get it as scruffy as I can, but I wish that my brother can grow a great Gr- beard. Great full beard. Since he was like in college, dude. Really? And he can just throw one out. Me, on the other hand, I get me about four little scraggly guys. That's and I'm me. Like, I put it on. I'm like, man, I look like Tom Selleck, son. <laughs> but in reality, I just look like a prepubescent child. Yep. You yep. Know? Dude, I, I remember like the first time I started like growing like hairs on my cheek when I was in like, I was I think I was like 16 when I started like, oh, it's happening. Yeah. And then it, it never got better. It was like, I still get those same like six whiskers. Absolutely. That's why I can, I can grow almost the... Full around goatee. Oh, yeah. That's why I keep the goatee, but I I can grow a neck beard all the way down to my chest throw. Nice. But I can't grow it up to my cheekbones. Oh, dude. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the longest time I had trouble connecting yeah. the mustache to the little chin to the beard. Goatee. And it's kind of gone. It's kind of getting going now. But I really do like what I've deemed. And I let me see your face over here. You got a little <laughs> bit of a soul patch going? A little bit a of little one. A little bit of one. When you get the soul patch in the mustache, I call that the soul stash. Ooh, I like that. Yes, sir. And that's what I've been kind of rocking the over soul the stash. past year. And it keeps my face clean, but I get a little bit of something, something right there. You know, <laughs> just let everybody know I can do it. You know? Yeah, I like that. <laughs> mm-hmm. This is great conversation for an audio only podcast. That's right? just comparing our facial hair. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll put, we'll put screenshots up of the different. Yeah, well, different we, we do like episode announcements, and normally it's like cool posed pictures. Pictures, but right. this one will just be like a close-up of our facial hair. Yeah, absolutely. I'm in, <laughs> dude. I'm in. Man, thanks for joining us this week. I'm excited to get to know you a little bit better because, like, I know we've done shows together for years, but mm-hmm. I know you've probably had the same 90-second conversations with people at bars where you know each other, you like each other, but then you realize, dang, I don't really know anything about you. Yeah, dude. I mean, you got to go through and you got to make your rounds and – you know, at your shows and stuff, you, there's a hundred people trying to get your attention and talk to you. Right. And, you know, and then I'm floating around trying to meet other riders and stuff. And that's a cool thing about this town is even though I am from here, you know, most people are transplants. And uh, the cool thing that I found when I started really hitting the town and you were one of the first people I really got introduced to out on really? the town. Yeah. Um, is that 
you know, I can stay here for my whole life and have so many friends here in this like region. And then you just go a mile down the road and you don't know anybody, anybody. man. And, you know, it was cool because it keeps me intrigued and I keep like I get to meet new people and and not have to go too far to do it. But at the same time, you know, a lot of people, when they come here, they they have to make friends. Mm -hmm. You know, they have to they have to build these relationships. And and I'm not like putting that down, but it's something that I really didn't have to do. Yeah, you had a life here. You yeah. were born into a life here, basically. Yeah, and you know, I see a lot of like uh, a lot of people with Nashville tour stop and right. stuff, and th they're always hanging out with each other and stuff. And I like to I like to go in and and spend time with those people, and then like, but I also got to go back and tend to my old friends. Right. You know, I had to cancel on. Uh, we do this trip with my college buddies called the River House, mm -hmm. and we go up to our buddy's River House up in East Tennessee. Cool. Every once in a while, you know, we're all getting older. Some of us got kids, some of us married, stuff like that. And, you know, we just go out there and get a little wild out in the woods and you stuff. Get, you and, just get to be boys again. Yeah, but I had to cancel because we're going to Columbia, Missouri, you know. And That's that, my hometown. Oh, for real? I'm yeah. going to Nash Vegas, baby. <laughs> You're playing Nash Vegas. Yeah, it'll be Have our been second there time. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the, that was actually the first out-of-town four-hour show. It was the first four-hour show I had ever done. All right. Acoustic or with a band. But I had my new band with me. Um, the guys that I'm playing with now, um, they're out of Murfreesboro. And I had played one gig back in the day with the drummer. Mm -hmm. And he had hit me up at like the top of the year last year and was like, hey, me and my boys have a band. We just need a front guy. And I was like... No kidding, bro. I, <laughs> I was like, I'm a front guy and I need a band. <laughs> and so uh, we were running around and then my buddy AJ Gacio hit Shout me Shout out up. AJ. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, he hit me up and was like, "You, yo, you want to go rip Nash Vegas? And I was like, we had been practicing for like a month or so. Like, yeah. you know, we hadn't had any gigs at all. And uh, yeah, then we just jumped out there and ripped it. And bro, we went out there and the first two songs, I think it was like Fast As You – by Dwight Yoakam and then something else. And I absolutely screwed both of them up <laughs> so bad. The <laughs> owner came up and was like, hey, bro, get it together, you know? <laughs> and then, like, once we got settled in and me and the boys got up there and, like, got comfortable, I mean, you know, the Friday night of these shows is always a little hairier right. than the Saturday because you, you don't know what kind of crowd you're rolling you with. You do two days. And, uh, I mean, when we can, when gotcha. we get offered to, most of the time we're ripping two days. Um, but I mean, by the end of it, dude, we left Saturday night and uh, me and the boys had done Freebird. And uh, unfortunately enough, I still don't even really sing Freebird right. And there's not even that much singing in <laughs> nope. it, dude. I just it's don't know. It's about nine minutes well. of guitar solo. Yeah. Well, I got off stage and I was just hanging out, you know, videoing the whole thing. And and, and when when the guitar solo kicked in, I was on stage and and from behind me, I just felt this force move my entire body out of the way. And I was like, I, like I kind of turned around because I was on stage. I was like, who just shoved me up right. here? Dude, it was my boy Bryce Ayler's ripping the axe, and he had just ch like rhinoed me out of the way, <laughs> and was just absolutely power stanced up on the monitor, <laughs> rock star. Going. And when it, when he did that, I was like, oh yeah, I was like, this <laughs> is honky tonking, dude. This yeah. is what I I need this in my life. And I just got out in the crowd, started videoing stuff. I mean, it was so hype; people were going nuts. I took a beer bottle and was just shaking it, doing a beer shower everywhere, dude. Ended up breaking my cell phone. Did you really? Yeah, dude. I had to go back to Nashville and buy a whole new, used half of my bag for that, that we got from to get a new freaking iPhone 11 that I think I'm still paying on. And so, but uh, shout out Freebird, dude. Shout out you Columbia, know. Missouri. Yeah, and Bryce, man. He rips. Dude, that town goes hard. Yeah, dude, it was a crazy bar. I mean, you know, you do have kids out there who, when I get out of town, because that's kind of been my goal, right? Is uh, and I, I'm sure we've had this discussion before. Is like in town, I kind of have to be careful, right, with how many shows I do and like, you know, what they consist of, especially if they're ticketed, because you know. All of the people that come here are like my lifelong friends and stuff, mm -hmm. and like they do want to support me. But at the same time, you can't really overload them. 
Mm -hmm. You know, if you overload them and ask too much of the people who like really care about you and everything, like, you know, my parents will always be there every show. They mm -hmm. don't care. But like with people who have lives and stuff like, like, you know, they get, not that my parents don't have lives, but <laughs> sorry, Donna, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I like to think that I'm closer to the center of theirs right. than, you know, most people. Um, but you know, I kind of just have to be careful and space it out so that when, when we do shows like Alley Taps that one time, like we get a show out, you know, right. and, uh, you know, if we did that one night and then I had a show the same caliber at Live Oak the next night, either half, both of them's going to get cut down in half yep. or, you know, one of them's not. So one of them's going to blow out and one of them's going to be terrible. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've played a really big hand in just trying not to oversaturate my local crowd right. and the people that I hang out with and stuff just to keep it all interesting because it gives me time to like change it up right do something a little different okay well it's been three months might be time to grab another show in town and I mean I'll say another thing is like you know showcases in town they they don't really make you any money either oh, so, it's brutal I mean before I got in touch with these guys that's why I'm, I go by Hunter Taylor in the favors right. is because I was just hitting up guys and girls that like just wanted to help me out and be a part of it and, and, you know, give me a hand and get up on stage and jam. And, you know, one day I was like, man, I'm just so grateful for all these people helping me out and doing such big favors for me. And I was like, bingo. Name of the band. Hunter Taylor and the favors, man. I love that. Yeah, because when we were starting out, man, and even the guys now, I mean, they still cut me favors. It helps out a little more, though, because cool. we do get these out-of-town gigs, and I try to get out of town more. That's where I was going with this is, try to go out of town to Columbia and stuff yeah. to expand my reach. Cause you can oversaturate those places mm -hmm. a little easier. And with your posting and stuff, people still see that you're doing stuff, but they don't have to deal with it. Yeah. You know what it's I'm exciting to get to see your friend, get to have a tour date. Mm -hmm. And then it's, it's, it's like when your plans get canceled for a night, yeah. you're, you're kind of pissed, but you're also part of you is like, Oh, this is nice. Yeah, Doing I'm about nothing to is great. Catch up on all of Game of Thrones. You know? <laughs> yeah. Man, I I relate to that all too well. Like because I mean, doing my shows, I've had people play in my shows for years, and I hate that. Like I've had thousands of people play, and you just it's impossible to get the good stuff to everybody every time. And that's why, like, really early on when we first met, I I, I forget exactly the terms of it, but we were just talking about it before we started recording. It was a thousand dollar bet of some kind i yeah, don't remember man. the terms what what was it yeah dude so uh when i far, first started running around out on the town it was post covid and it was kind of like right as all of the bars were letting people back in you know they had been letting people back in for a while but there was an early curfew right bars shut down early and that, uh, that 10 p.m curfew killed me man mm -hmm. it was it was it was brutal but uh sometimes i still stayed out later then 10 yep you know we've talked about that <laughs> the yeah. the uh the wink wink we're closed a little speakeasy action yeah and i mean yeah it was wild but uh when i started going out it was a big shell shock for me because like i said earlier i went a mile down the road and i didn't know anybody right. and i was nobody to any like anyone in the bar you know they didn't know who i was uh, for all i could have been was you know dumbo from <laughs> you know anywhere right? right but uh so i got out there and started kind of running around and i had i had some contacts my brother does uh he does music right and he's a songwriter and he used to run around the town a lot and uh he doesn't do as much anymore he works with creative vets uh, i can tell you oh more cool about yeah that i know later. creative vets um he does a lot of that now and um but so i knew some people through him and like you know but i was still a new guy you know um and so when I got out there, I kind of started running around, but I was confident that that I knew, like, once COVID was kind of over, I called my buddy Sam, and I was like, it's time. Like, I'm going to get a band together. We're going to throw a show, and it's going to be nuts. It's going to be nuts. huge. And, you know, I was trying my best to not be cocky about it, but I rolled into Alley Taps one night to a Nashville tour stop show, and I had seen a lot of your posts, and I was like, man – I really want to get in on National Tour Stop. Uh, my buddy Matt Gorman had played out yep. there. And I was like, dang, Matt's in on Nashville. Like, let me, you know, let's see what's going on out there. So I rolled out there one night, and it was your it was your birthday. Oh, Jesus. It was your <laughs> birthday. 
<laughs> what a night to meet me. Yeah, dude. Yeah, tell me about it. And uh, the girl I was with was like, yeah, it's his birthday. Like, let me let me go, you know, track him down and you can talk to him. And so I like went up to you and I was like, hey, man, I'm Hunter, you know, all this other stuff. And I was like, uh, you know, I, I, I can get a band and play. And like, if if you let me play, I'll pack your house out. All right. And you said, you go, dude, if you bring, and I'm pretty sure if my memory serves me right, you're like, if you even bring 50 people to a show, <laughs> I'll give you $1,000. <laughs> and I heard that and I kind of sat in my head and I was like, dang, dude, 50 is a lot. Like that's yep. a, that's a big, that's a tall order in Nashville. That's a tall order. And I was like, I've never done this, but I was like, okay, <laughs> like worst comes to worst, bro. I'll dish out like. Ten dollars to everybody that shows up, <laughs> and I'll make me five hundred. You know, you <laughs> and, uh, and then so eventually, you know, I played National Tour Stop a few times, and then uh, you know, you graciously let us come out there and rip it. Right. And uh, dude, still to this day, that was one of my favorite shows. And uh, and I mean, I don't even know how many people we brought, but it's it's funny that you mentioned that because. One of the reasons I am, am, I don't want to use the word, one of the reasons that Tour Stop has been a successful show is because I just track all the data for everything. So oh, I right. actually I actually have an exact count of how many people were at that show. That's so cool, man, because I love analytics and stuff. Yep. So let's see. That was April 22nd of 2021. Wow. At Alley Taps. And let's just go right here to that week. So do you want to, do you want to just guess how many people were there mm, i would say it was under 200 it was under 200 probably over 150 though you start when you started the band you promote i also tracked you promoted your show 22 times on social media oh, nice. you also did prints i've got your print on the on the wall of my office you own the first hunter taylor in technical poster even <laughs> though it's the size of an index card yep you own the first printed Edition printer poster, yeah. of Hunter Taylor concert posters, but I knew you were you were grinding hard for that show. Oh, we wanted it bad. And man. when you started, there were 134 people, and then when you uh, about halfway through your set, there were 155. Oh, nice, nice. big ass crowd, man, dude. And it was rowdy. And I mean, those and it, like I said, that was one of the first ones. Really, before my crowd and like all of my friends had mm -hmm. kind of. One moved out of town because a lot of my friends were still in college, right? You know that I knew and everything. I was really more in touch with the collegiate crowd, and uh, you know they they hadn't seen me doing this as much. So it was like a big, oh wow, you know we had done one previously, but there was still sanctions on how many people right. could get in the. So it we definitely weren't allowed to have that many people at the bar. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the bar's capacity was supposed to be like 40. Hey, dude, what happens in the alley stays. That, no kidding. In the, stays in the alley, my man. Well, uh, let's see. You want another? Yeah, I'll take one. Let's I'll have another. Here, I'm We're drinking a, a classic. Here. Cheers you up. Cheers. We're drinking a classic American Bud Light here. Mm -hmm. There's a, I don't know if there's many more things more American than. I'm a Miller Lite guy myself. Are you really? But I do live by the philosophy that if it works, I'll drink it. I, uh, I, yeah, exactly. Mm, it it gets me to the same place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, it's all about the destination. <laughs> yeah, man. And that show was really the beginning of uh, why I wanted to start like working with you because I saw like there's so many people and let's let's just ignore the work. There's so many people who are just so freaking talented in Nashville, and then sometimes talent's just not enough. You got to put in that extra something. Yeah, man. I mean. I've never really claimed to be like the best singer or, right. you know, guitar picker or anything like that. But, um, you know, one thing that I've always loved to do is just talk. I yep. mean, you'd be, you wouldn't be surprised how many times I've been told to shut up in my life, you know, <laughs> but, uh, it has been at least a handful. And, uh, but like, you know, just being behind crowds, I was raised up in the church of Christ. Right. And, you know, uh, one thing I've said for a long time is if you can go up and talk, to a predominantly white Middle Tennessee Church of Christ group, you can talk in just front about anybody, <laughs> man. I mean, it, it, that's a, that's a pretty starch crowd right there. Yeah, they're they're not they're not just gonna laugh at any joke you drop. 
And honestly, I'll tell you, one of one of the best jokes I've ever dropped and one of the best crowd reactions I've ever gotten was in front of my hometown church on our was senior really? night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I told this uh we you know, we had senior night and you go and you know, all the seniors stand up in line and they thank you know their parents and anybody really closely involved in right. just being there for them throughout all of school and growing up. A lot of these kids were born into it. I pretty much was. I've been going there since first grade. Right. And uh you know, I thanked some people and told them, you know, I was like, I was like, okay, uh, you know, I got to have at least a little something funny, you know, give a little bit of lightheartedness. And uh, I was like, oh, I want to thank y'all for, you know, not kicking me out yet because, you know, I know I've done a few things to deserve that, you know, <laughs> and it got a little chuckle and I was like, not good enough, <laughs> not good enough. We have to top this. And so I kind of rambled a little bit. And then I came across this man, uh, one of the fathers of the girl, one of the girls in my grade, and his name's Alan Hood. We actually share the same birthday, fun fact. Nice. So I text him on his birthday every year. And uh, I looked at him, and I saw him and his wife sitting there, and I said, uh, also, I want to thank the Hoods. They don't know it yet, but I plan on being their son-in-law one day. <laughs> <laughs> and buddy, I I've never ever seen a crowd erupt <laughs> like they did and because it, that girl's probably like what? Oh, dude, she turned <laughs> just bloodshot red, and like nobody knew what to do, and like it was like I don't know. I've definitely told jokes that didn't land, and that's a horrible feeling. That is a horrible feeling. That was one of the most electric moments <laughs> of my life, dude. Telling a joke that immediately hits is it's it's like it's it's like I, I can't even put it to words it's it's magical oh yeah dude i mean just to arise that kind of like emotion I did out it. of somebody yep. like it because like the way people laugh is so disgusting like <laughs> no. you know like people have gross laughs and then when you compile it all together you're just like i just made all of i these just made people. you do that <laughs> yeah like i just made y'all do that that's that's crazy. Yep. But yeah, I mean, even out of all of the honky tonking and everything like that, that is probably one of the most electric moments I've ever had in front of a crowd. Have you ever been to the Bento Living rooftop stage, the Chestnut Hill? It's funny you say that. It's funny you say that. Yes, I have. I played one show out there and uh, I was actually supposed to play one Saturday. Mm -hmm. and like I said earlier, I drive the pedal taverns around. Right. And, uh, I got put on schedule for Saturday as well. Oh, dang. I know, and I've been texting my boss for the past couple of days trying to get my shift covered, which right. is kind of taboo. You're supposed to, like, request off a month in advance, right. which I never do. We're getting so many last-minute shows these days that, like, it's almost impossible for me. But, it like, nobody could pick it up. Nobody could cover the shift. So I was texting Damien. Mm -hmm. We talked about him earlier. Shout-out Damien C. Um, Damien is headlining the show, and Damien – rocks this joint he does it's made for like damien's whole vibe his r&b his horn guy everything and like people come to see him out there and like some of the most fun shows i've attended has been damien c shows on the rooftop of Sweet. bento and so i was like texting him today i was like bro i feel so bad i i don't you know want to cancel and i don't i think i'm gonna be able to make it right but like it's gonna be game time so like Luckily, my um, bass player, Adam Corbin, I think yep. he's played Nashville, too. He played uh, y'all's Tin Roof show back a few weeks yep. ago, which was a great show. He's awesome. Um, yeah, he did so good, man. I was sitting there honestly getting jealous of him, the way he was just honky-tonking that guitar, <laughs> man. I was like, dang, dude, I need to get back together with him and just crank out a couple of honky-tonk yep. heaters. Um, but I was like, Adam can just play bass and sing with my guys and like, you know, we, we can work something out if I can't make it. You know, right. they can learn his stuff real quick. And, uh, but funny you mentioned the bento. They canceled the show. Oh, Literally, <laughs> as I was driving over here, yeah, uh, supposedly they didn't have like enough uh, understaffed. Right. They were understaffed. And uh, so they canceled on us. I love the venue, but, you know, I personally have never done the hottest there it's not your it's not your it's not a, a venue that's made for what you're trying to do yeah and i believe that you could turn any venue into a honky tonk and i think we can up until now they've done ticketed shows up there right and like ticketed shows are They're hard. pretty much like just dropping a hammer on your attendance and yep. probably not the best thing for me to say when we're about to do one in <laughs> december but uh but most of those have like there's just been some issues and stuff that like 
one of the first ones I was going to do. I was uh, like, I had all that promo right. like that we were doing for your show, and that's one thing I love to do. We had it all built up. I had posted it. Got COVID. Duh. Had to get rescheduled two weeks later. No, you know, a few people were there, and I sh- thank everybody who came out to it. But no, the reason I bring up Bento Living is because I was playing and around there one night, and it's right directly next door to train tracks. Mm-hmm. And I was in the middle of one of my songs, and then right in the middle, train just bellows, just oh yeah. And I didn't even like what happened with like I told a joke, and I didn't hear myself. I didn't think. I didn't hear myself. What happened is I said the joke, which is, I've been training for this my whole life. And I heard the joke with everybody else. It was just like, oh, my God, that's hilarious. Dude, that's gold, man. But that's, I had one of those same moments where you're just like, I feel electric right now. It's like, yeah, man. that joke is going to be the best part of this song. I should just stop halfway through. Absolutely, man. And, you know, if there's one thing that I wish, like, more musicians would understand is like a lot of a lot of what you do and like how the crowd receives you is not what you play it's what you're Absolutely. doing when you're not playing man yeah. because i've seen people play and then you know overhear other people and just be like ah you know they didn't really talk to the crowd or anything yep. like that and like i'll cut four songs to have a conversation with people yep. just to you know just Make it feel like you're them. you're interacting with them, not just playing at them. I'm also no Chris Stapleton, so generally I'm trying to save a little bit of time because <laughs> I'm afraid I'm gonna run out of some songs. I guess man. it takes one to know one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know if I know if I run through songs too fast, I'm gonna end up having to sing "She's Country" and shake my hind end a little bit. <laughs> now that's just not something I love to do, but I will do it. If you're the not are above wanting. "She's Country," but it's not your it's not your first pick. Yeah. yeah well, <laughs> she's. Con- Oh, she's country's Jason Aldean. Country girl, shake it is Luke Bryan. Both of them, I've come to enjoy to play if the crowd's right because they love it. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> but sometimes I do. <laughs> do you remember the old stage monitors at Belcourt Taps that had uh, electrical tape on them that said "No wagon wheel, no free falling"? Yes, sir, I do. That is a pivotal experience of nashville because you realize it's like oh damn like there's people that really don't want to hear cover tunes oh yeah it's like yeah i mean this town was built on original songs absolutely and it sucks that like i hate to say it glorifies all these freaking cover tunes hit it do it right on the mic or there we go (laughs) no but we uh we we have so many places that do cover tunes i love just getting to uh just play original songs like absolutely because i don't particularly love just going and listening to cover tunes but mm-hmm. what i do get more enjoyment out of is like oh shit i don't know this song right. i would like to learn more about this person yeah because you can actually you might hear the next big hit song yeah it's absolutely. cool stuff like that yeah dude and i mean i'm so glad that there are people out there like you that are running these you know writers rounds and stuff um you know as an artist when I when I first started running, and I'll be real honest with you, is when I first started running, you know, I needed to network a lot more than I do now because, like I said, I went right. a mile down. I didn't know anybody in this faction. You know, I knew a handful of people, but when you know some people, it don't mean as much unless a lot of people know who you are, right. you know. And so, like, recently, you know, and in the past, like, I'd say probably, you know, honestly, nine months, stuff like that. I haven't been running around doing riders rounds. I mean, I haven't played a riders round in not one of my ages. Yeah, and I mean, you know, it's just really hard. One because as an artist, like it is, it's expensive. Yep, it's expensive to go out there and you know you stay for four or five hours because you kind of make friends and you wait to see friends and then you're doing a little drinking, catch them. Them yep. Tuesday is it Tuesday night deals the the special the, the seven it was like seven dollar combos or seven dollar yeah yeah um what did Tyler Downs shout out Tyler Downs uh me and him called it and we we would always say and Mama forgive me for what I'm about to say y'all don't have to bleep this and out but me and Tyler Downs back in 2001 would run around saying damn the deal <laughs> we would say damn the deal because. We would go out to the Nashville Tourist Stop shows at Alley Taps, dude, and just get smoked out smoked. there, dude. I mean, 
Dude, we would leave, and like the next day, me and him would just have conversations, and she'd be like, "What?" You know? You're like, "Why? Why do I have a peach-sized bruise on my leg? Where did this come from?" Yeah, man. And you're like <laughs> getting ready to go on stage, or you got to go talk to so many new people. Psh, go grab you a seven dollar shot and a cold beer, dude. It doesn't, you know. You're like, that's you basically know. giving it away. <laughs> it's so cheap. It's so, and and uh, most bars have increased their prices at this mm, point. But yeah. gosh, that was a sweet moment for uh for that COVID friendly day. Oh man, it was cold and like everybody was just so tired of being cooped up and yep. just so glad dude, to be that, out. That bar got so crowded, like. It did. I mean, for the amount of like recluseness that people were involved in, like it was packed. I mean, for riders' rounds and everything too. Yep. And I mean, thinking back at, on it now, I mean, I'm so grateful for that period of time to where I was hanging out at Taps and like Alley and Cabana and Belcourt and stuff. R.I.P. Belcourt. R.I.P. Belcourt. And, we say that uh, every week on the pod. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the funny thing is, is like, you know, I, I've been around Belcourt for a long time. Right. Because like I said, my brother, he he's a songwriter. And I remember going out there even when I was in high school. Right. Seeing him play shows out in Belcourt and everything like that. And, you know, it honestly, when it when it did go away, I, I'd been out there so much. I was like, this will probably be good for me in my wallet. Yep. You know, but it, it is kind of a kind of a shame. To see something like that, a place that really did house so much original music over the years, and the like, the generations yep. of the town, like that was Luke Combs, Mary Norris. That's, yeah, that was their home. Yeah, man. And it, I mean, it does make us think, like, all right. So if we're talking about Mary Norris and Luke Combs this way, who's going to talk about us right. this way? Right. Because. Five years from now, who the hell knows what's going to be the next big thing? Oh man, I don't it's going to be Hunter good, Taylor and the Favors. <laughs> yeah, I hope, I hope they're just talking about me, son. You know. But, well, hey, uh, let's take a quick break. We'll come right back with the Nashville Tour Stop Podcast. <laughs> Welcome back to the Nashville Tour Stop Podcast. Thanks for tuning in this week. We've got Mr. Hunter Taylor. You've been listening so far so good. Taking a puff of his uh, some flavor of uh, some pen. Is it peach flavor or something? peach one, man. I'm not proud to say I'm puffing on it, but it does but you fix got it. me up. You it, know gets, it, it, it gets you where you need to be. Yep. It's saving my jaw from that Copenhagen, <laughs> dude. Man, we've been doing a lot of uh, a lot of talking, and in the in the break, we did a little bit of extra drinking. But what I want to talk to you about now is something that I really like talking about: is the songwriting process. And it's different for everybody. And some things work for some people; some things don't work for others. But how how does a song start for you? And you could say literally anything. Does it start with a hook? Does it start with I like the chord? Just what is what does it look like for you when you start a song? Uh, man, for me, every song is a, it's a different creation. You know, uh, a lot of them come from nothing, none of them's ever the same. You know, uh, I keep a big list of just like w what I call one liners, you know, Random not all of them ideas. are hooks. Um, a lot of them are just stuff that I find intriguing the way that the English language says stuff and the way that like I kind of relate to saying things. Because uh, I talk different than you do. Right. And I talk different than Will does, you know, and he talks different than me. So the way somebody might word something would stick out to him over me. So I keep a big list in my phone of just, you know, song ideas or whatever. That's what I call them. But they're just one liners. And lots of times I found myself compiling a lot of different ones of those into one song that just kind of I feel like I love idioms. I'm not I, exactly sure what the long definition list of, idioms, of an yeah. idiom is, but I've looked them up and I love them, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, but it, it could either start with that. It could either start with, you know, just, just something that I'm singing, just a right. melody. Uh, and if I find something cool on the guitar that I'm just vibing with and I like to do, then I'll, I'll roll with that, make a track or something, put it away for six months, archive it, and then come back later have that for somebody else who can relate to it more than I can. Um, 
the songwriting process though i'm a slow writer i am as well i i you know very rarely catch myself just cranking out a song i don't write often Mm -hmm. um i kind of have my songs that that i've been sitting on for a long time that get me by and uh that i really do like to play and and they fit well in my set and uh you know, I'm kind of waiting to get around to recording those, and then as more come along, I'll push, you know, get those in the cut. Um, I've written some recently that I'm like, okay, these rose, this rose to the top of the list. This will be next in line. But uh, we'll filter those in and out. But, you know, when it comes to people who are busting it out and writing two to three songs a day, that's man, hard. that's not me. Like, that's just not the the section of the business that I've quite gotten into yet. And is it something you would be interested in or is it just a, a, is it your creative brain that doesn't lend itself to that? Uh, I mean, I think it kind of depends. Um, right now, no, I, you know, uh, I thrive on being the center of attention. I love being in front of people. Like it's my, it's one of my most comfortable places. Even when I'm burning red hot and my ears are red, like I would rather be there than sitting like in a room with my second stranger of the day trying to just figure out right. something to create. Uh though I do like doing that at times, I don't really like overloading myself with mm-hmm. it. Also, I've never really over like I have, but I haven't and a lot of the times that I just haven't really come up with as much as I would really like to. Are you mostly a solo songwriter? Um I sing probably, I think I have like maybe one or two songs that I sing that I've written by myself. Okay. But they've taken me a very long time. Like right right now there's, I have countless like voice memos and stuff of songs that, that I have that, you know, I just need more time to finish and haven't gotten in the right room or you know somebody right hadn't bitten on them yet or anything like that because i'll come in and just be like hey i have these i haven't finished them yet you know i have a verse and a chorus but dude i you know i can't come up with a second verse you know i don't know what's going on here and you know it, it's just a really slow process for me and it's a lot easier for me and makes a little more money to go out and right find me a gig and get better at you know being in front of people and and getting really like, you know, in time with just performing and being an entertainer. And uh, those songs, I believe, will come with time. And uh, I'm not afraid to cut somebody else's song. Right. You know, I love the songwriting process. I love writing songs. I think I'll do it for the rest of my life. But I do know that there are plenty of people out here in this town who are writing heaters that are never getting seen. And I want a piece of them, dude. If yep. Hey, if it's the right song, give it to me. Yeah, bro. If you think that you got a HT song, send it to me, dude. <laughs> I would love to listen His to it. His DMs are open. Absolutely. I mean, because <laughs> I I would love to put on people who want to do that. Right. Who who want to be in that situation because I particularly don't want to be in that situation. You know, that wake up and you know, get a cup of coffee go write a verse, get another cup of coffee, finish the song, go to a next and be like kind of aggravated because you didn't finish a song. And like with me, I feel like I, you know, it, it's kind of just a self-conscious thing for me because I've gotten in so many rooms and not finished so many songs with people that I'm like, I really wanted to finish that with them. And I feel like I didn't do them justice and kind of wasted their time. And so, you know, I love writing songs, but I'm also quite afraid of it at the same time, just because it does take me so long. And I think a lot of it is that I I get too much in my in my head about lyrics. You know, I I, I want to be so poetic mm-hmm. and like so like I want everything to just really link up so well. And then I just hear songs that I've been listening to for years. That say some of the dumbest stuff I ever heard in my life, but buddy, it hits, <laughs> dude. Yep, it hits, man. And like I, I try keep trying to reel myself back in and be like, okay, you don't have to agree with it. Like you, you don't have to come up with every line. You know, whatever they said may not be what you were thinking, and it may not be what you think is going to be the best thing. 
but progress through it. All right. Get you a song, man, because a finished song is way more likely to be played out and and to be hashed out in that situation. See, I've written songs with so many of my friends that we have finished songs. I don't even know how they go. Yep. Oh, same. I've got I've got dozens of songs on my phone that if someone's like, "Hey, play this one," I'd be like, nah, "I don't have. I lost the work tape. I don't know how it goes anymore." Yeah, and it's, like I just gone. have to learn how to play it. And if I learn how to play it, it that song has a such a longer shelf life in right. my repertoire than if I just leave that right and don't play it out. And that's one reason why I do love writers' rounds, right? Because it, it puts you in a position to be like, okay, well, I can try this song out tonight because, you know, I'll be way less likely to sit there and learn a song in front of my drywall crowd. Right. That's what I call my bedroom, mm-hmm. my drywall crowd. And, uh, but I mean, then I just get in a situation to where we get shows come up and right. me and my boys, like, you know, we know the songs that we know, yep. you know. And, uh, and people love the hits, man. Yeah. And so we're just going to keep rolling with that and, you know, one of these days I will go back in and like if I do come across like a pub deal or something, then I'll be w- I think I'll be way more likely to fill up my day because right, right now with as many jobs as I work and stuff, it's it's so you got to do an evening right and by the time I get off work, you burn out. You burn Sorry. out, you don't you know, you don't really get anything done and then also like you got to turn around and go see your buddy out on the town. Or you got to go do something else. And so, like, that's all rushed and everything. And it's just a, it's a very difficult process, in my opinion. I respect people who really cut it up. Um, one thing that I've always, like, wanted to get involved in with, and I and I didn't, I almost did. I, I worked on a song for it. You had to do, like, a like a tryout song for mm-hmm. this uh, business called Song Finch. Yeah, I know Song Finch. And I a lot of artists around town make make a killing off of that. And dude, I sat down and and I can't remember what one of the trial things was for it, but I started looking at it and started trying to write a song and in about 30 minutes, dude, I was half a line in and <laughs> over it, bro. Like this is not it. Cuz I just couldn't get past my mental of what I feel like a song should be. Right. And I just stand in my way a lot of the times. Because the songs that those song finch projects are needing to deliver don't need to be the next great work of art. They're literally just directly crafting someone's story. Absolutely. And they're not looking for the next number one mm-hmm. the same way you are. Mm-hmm. And that's that's one of the reasons why I've never gotten into that. And I used to do – uh commission jingle writing like i'd get, oh, I, I did a lot charlie of charlie sheen two and a half men on him bro yeah you know i did about that i did say what charlie sheen that's what he did oh yeah that's exactly men. what charlie he was two a and jingle and writer yeah. yeah i used to do jingle writing and i loved it and then man something just clicked in my brain where all of a sudden i just i did not like it i was getting commissions left and right and they'd be like hey i'm doing this and this and this and i want it to sound like this and god it just sucked man and th- I think it comes back to kind of what we're talking about is being creative on a schedule is hard. Oh, yeah. Inspiration doesn't just show up at 8 o'clock on a Monday morning. Right. It might show up at 8 o'clock on a Monday morning, but it also might show up any other time when you're not ready for it. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, yeah, everybody screams that it. Songwriting is a muscle. And um, a lot of the stuff that I've found myself doing – is uh, over the past year, I've, I've moved into a house with a couple other writers. Right. And so we have a studio set up, and That's they're cool. both drummers, which is very good for me because I am very lacking in percussion. You know, I know my way around the guitar. I'm no Vince Gill, but uh, <laughs> but I. You we know, say that because Vince Gill is outside of our podcast studio. No joke right now. He's chilling out there, and <laughs> I've totally thought about gun and professing my admiration for him but it was at the wrong time because some guy was talking i think it's the yep. head of martin guitars shout out martin guitars if y'all have any extra ones that need to be given away hunter taylor hillbilly two underscores hunter on instagram <laughs> could use a new it's just a custom series x i'll take another one if you have one to spare yet the martin guitar showroom the martin headquarters in nashville is upstairs at our office here that's so wild, man. Yep. So a PR firm who's in the building represents Martin, 
And the woman who owns the PR firm also owns the building. So she's like, man, all these companies that I represent, why not just move into my building? So she gives them just space. So now there's just a Martin guitar showroom upstairs here. Dang, man. I swear to God, man, the number of times I've Might been sitting in here. I have to go get my here, ski mask and I'm swipe looking at my, one. my baby Martin right here, and I'm just like, I know there's a nicer version of this upstairs Dang, right now. Dang, man. <laughs> that's fresh. I love, the, I love the marks you got on it, man. That, I love and that's the, one of the things I like about guitars that you can see have been played. You put in the hours. Oh, yeah. Because have you ever seen those guitars that are uh, pre, prefab, like faded? I've seen more of like electric ones yeah. that are kind of just like beat up and stuff like that. I don't that. like that. Earn your, literally earn your stripes, man. Yeah. Like every bump and scuff on that guitar, I could tell a story about what happened. Like the first time, like my electric guitar here, hold on. This uh, gold Ibanez ART100 that I've got here was, I think it was like 300 bucks when I first bought it. And it's just a cheap electric guitar, but I've used this on every project I've ever done. Uh, all my studio work, all my session work, every band I've ever played in. But right here behind the fifth fret, there's a big ding in the neck from when, nice, I, was, when I was 16. I just leaned it up against a bar stool and it uh, fell over onto my old guitar pedal board. And I was pissed because I had gotten this guitar like a day before. And I was like, damn it, there's a huge crack in the neck now. And then I yeah. realized, oh, shit. Like, now I don't have to look at where my hand is on the guitar. Mm -hmm. It's like Braille. Oh, because dude. now I can just immediately know where the fifth fret is. And I'm like, oh, okay, never mind. I like this now. That's awesome, But man. yeah, it's just stuff like that that you don't get that if you just buy a prefab, faded, dented guitar. Oh, yeah. And I mean, like I said, I play a Martin Custom X series. And uh, it's it's a little bit bigger than yours, mm -hmm. but it, it's still a small a guitar. A smaller body. Is it the auditorium-sized body guitar? I don't know what that means. So it's a uh, it's not a cutaway, but it's not the super super dreadnought huge guitar. It's not a big one. I mean, uh, is it the guitar you're playing in the poster there? Yeah, it's that yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking I've about. had that one for a very long time, and uh, it's I really love a guitar with a natural finish. Mm -hmm. uh, I got clammy hands. That's why I don't like to play other people's guitars. The lacquer ones don't feel good. I'll I'll run. I have to use elixir strings like. Yep. Uh, during COVID, Elixir ran out of their uh, did coated. they really? I didn't know that they did, and it was very very hard to find some. And I tried like Diadarios, mm -hmm. their coated ones, ruined them in a week. Yeah, I mean they just get so dirty. And man, I, I love the natural finish, uh, the the polished finish, the glaze is what I call it. I don't know what the technical term is, but uh, fingerprints and stuff, I hate that. Mm -hmm. I'll take a scratch on my on the wood of my yep. guitar over fingerprints. Yep any day and uh it's getting to the point though i've had that guitar bought it off of facebook really i think my mom actually bought it for me probably is what i would assume and uh was I've that had your it. first guitar no it wasn't i would had like a, a few guitars and i borrowed a lot of my brother's guitars when i was kind of starting to learn right. and he had had like my grandfather's guitar and stuff like that and they were his and so i use a lot of his thank you jesse i appreciate you brother um but uh, I had a green one, cool. and uh, it was an Alvarez. Nice. And the I was in a at Lipscomb. It's a Church of Christ college, and so they don't have national fraternities. They have really? social clubs. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> yeah. So I was in a social club, and it was it's called Tall Fi, and uh, Root Root Root, and um, their colors are green and white. And uh, we do this, our philanthropy event every year is called the Cowboy Show. And it's one of the longest running philanthropy events at Lipscomb. That's cool. And it's like the oldest club at Lipscomb that's still around. And uh, what we what we would do in college is, is we'd get up and we'd throw this big show called the Cowboy Show. And just all of the dudes, if you're in the club, you're getting on stage and you were singing a country song. We'd all dress up like cowboys or that's rednecks fun. or hillbillies, whatever, you know, you wanted to wear and uh, get up and sing a song, and we'd raise money and everything and donate it to whatever we were donating to that year. And so one day, my mom came back with a with a green Alvarez guitar. I don't know what kind, like what model it was, but uh, I wore that out throughout college, like cool. for a couple years in college, probably like one or two. And then eventually I was like, Mom, I need a guitar that's not green. I, I love good. Tall Fi, but... I need a I need a professional guitar. I need a yeah, I need just a standard guitar so I ain't the green guitar guy. 
People were calling it the iguana, which I now <laughs> love. But uh, but yeah. And so we went and picked that up off of a dude uh, off of Facebook Marketplace, and I have been absolutely beaten been the to hell heck and back with out that of that thing, thing man. I mean, I got blood on the inside of it, dude. Wow. I mean, and it's just for me being dumb playing without a pick. You can see on my finger right here, I got that like callus <laughs> yeah. right there. And so I didn't I know you there, didn't play with a with a pick. Well, I, I do most of the time. I do, my, but when I get to going or if I drop it or something and we're in the middle of boot scooting boogie, I ain't going to stop boogieing, son. <laughs> Grab me another pick. And so I get to running on it, and the way I smack my guitar, it'll just rip that little like, lip on my right behind my fingernail yep. up a little bit. And so when I'm hitting it, it splattered right down it. in the middle of it. And dude, when I seen that though, I was like, "That's metal, bro." Man, sometimes that's metal. Dude. Sometime when we get to move this guitar into Songwriters Hall of Fame, you just get to see that, and you be like, "Ah, that is in fact Hunter Taylor's guitar." You can see the blood stain right there. <laughs> yeah, man, it's getting to the point though. Uh, it, it's kind of it's getting a little too beat up. Uh, it's it's got you know the you can see the scrapes where i've been smacking mm. it and i tell everybody and and if i've ever borrowed your guitar on town i promise you i've told you this is i'm gonna beat the hell out of your guitar i'm sorry <laughs> and i've broken so many people's strings they'll hand me their guitar and i would just smoke it and like it's probably just bad yep. positioning and bad technique but it's the way that i do play and I don't take it easy on them things, man. I don't really believe in in buying something and not using it. You That's know? what this guitar is here, this Mini Martin, all this electrical tape I've got on the front of it. The reason I had to start layering so much of it on there is because it was turning into Trigger. It was turning into Willie Nelson. Yeah. I could have almost put my whole finger through the hole in the front of the face of it because I just play my guitar so hard. Yeah. And so you're you're in good company. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, the reason I think I'm gonna have to get me a new one is is at the back of it, like the back plate. Is it got on the buckle guitar. rash or something? Well, no, it's just separating. Oh, gotcha. It's separating, and I've told myself that I'm gonna use that guitar until it it possibly can't be used anymore. But now I'm kind of getting to the point. It's like, okay, well, I still have the iguana. The iguana is my backup guitar, you know. So I think. If it gets to a point to where I would rather hang that busted up Martin on the wall than hang it up where it is right there with a little bit of life yet yep. left in it and it still be able to, I would rather just hang it up there and it's not ever going to be able to play it's again. Dead. And it is, I'm going to kill that guitar. <laughs> I'm going to kill it before it's You want to put in your 250,000 miles. And I think that guitar deserves it, man. Yep. I mean, you know, I think it would, I don't know, uh can't remember, I think it was a Guy Clark song uh and i can't it might have just be called the guitar or something like that but uh and i could have this all mixed up in two different songs in my head but i think it's about like a guitar that's just hanging up like in a pawn shop really and like eventually somebody comes around and like snags it but like that's kind of how i feel with it dude and and now it's so good it, it takes a whole layer of stress off of my shoulders because i mean i don't really care like you, you like it more because it's fucked up. If that guitar, if that guitar gets like ruined or smashed, or like I'm not gonna smash it on purpose, but like if something were to happen to it, dude, I've got my two hundred and fifty dollars worth out of that guitar. Yep. I got that a long time long ago. Long time ago. And so I, I just love having it, and I don't have to worry about getting a new expensive guitar. I've got a peace of mind to just go get me another custom X series. Yep. And just snag that natural finish. Do the same thing to it. Drive it into the ground one more time. Because I don't really want to go get me a new, like a like a real expensive guitar right now. Just because we, we're road dogging it, man. And we're hustling and we're beating the heck out of stuff. And I'm not in a position to where I'm like, oh, yes. Let me snag my <laughs> nice little guitar and play it pretty for you. I get up on stage and I'm like, hey, y'all got me to come out here? We about to run it down on you. Yep. I feel and, bad for these people who are playing eight thousand dollar Gibsons and they're they're just prancing around with it. I'm like, man, that guitar is made to be played, but if it's eight thousand dollars, like, damn, that'll pay a mortgage, man. Like, it's hard bringing something like that to a gig. Yeah. When you know that like the guitar was built to be played. Yeah. They're not built to just be looked at. Well, I think some of them are. Think so. I think some of them are more artistically, like more meant for the visual aspect of it than 
to be played. I think that, you know, guitars as an inanimate object enjoy to be played, you know, but I think some of them would rather be admired. Right. And I think that, that it's all I've art. had girls like that. <laughs> they don't want to be played. They just want to be admired. Absolutely, man. <laughs> Absolutely. I heard that. I heard that. Well, hey, let's talk about what's coming for you this fall, because I know you got some big shows coming up. One of mine uh, is coming up. Two of yours. Two of mine, yeah. I don't know when the Tin Roof one is off the top of my head, but it's it's this month. That is October 25th, so that'll actually come out... this will this will be out the week before your plan. Yeah. This will oh, be out, nice. Okay. This will, this will be out five days before your plan. So Everybody come out. Tin Roof Broadway. If you're listening to this the day that it has come out today, October 20th, the year of our Lord Blake Shelton, oh. <laughs> uh, you can come see Hunter Taylor at Tin Roof Broadway on the and second the floor. Say what? And the favors. Hunter Taylor and the favors. Favors. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, they are playing for Nashville Tour Stop at Tin Roof Broadway's second floor stage. You're doing the closing set, my guy. I yeah, believe. man. You are tearing it down. They're going to start at ten o'clock. Yeah, I know you. Uh, I know you're going to bring the heat, man. We're going to run it down on you, man. And you, and you never, you, you haven't not delivered for me yet. That's a big week for us too. Uh, let's see. So yours is on the 25th. Yep. Then I got, and I've talked talk to y'all about Lipscomb University. Uh, we have a, we're playing there. Um, this fashion gala. Right. It's a black tie event. Ooh. And you're gonna uh, wear a bolo, a black bolo tie? I'm gonna dress I'm gonna make sure they know I'm not there to attend the event that I'm there honky tonking, <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, I told them that we would dress appropriately and I intend to do that, but uh it's a fashion gala, man. I've seen some stuff on TikTok. I've seen some people at these fashion shows wear hoodies. Now I ain't gonna wear a hoodie, like, but uh, I don't know how to dress fancy. Yeah, I'm wearing my nicest clothes right now. <laughs> well, yeah, man, I got I got this guy on a little Wrangler action, pearl snaps on, and everything like that. I hope Vince Gill saw me up there in my you look great. white shirt, man. I bet he was probably sitting there thinking, "I wonder who that is." <laughs> it's me, Hunter. <laughs> uh, but tell us about the Halloween show that's going to be uh, coming. Also, dude, the uh, Halloween show. So it's our third one, our third annual Halloween concert. Uh, we do it at Joe's place in Green Hills, which uh, Dang right. if you're a native, you probably know about Joe's place. If you're not and just hang out in that area, you know about Joe's place. A little dive bar, Great but bar. they have a back parking lot that uh, that we set up in. Last year was our first year doing it there, and uh, we went back with them this year, and uh, we have just an incredible lineup Who of artists. Uh, we have Damien C., Nashville. Shout out. Yes, sir. Nashville tour stop. Shout out Daddy Damien. That's what Abs- I call him. Oh, dude, a classic. A <laughs> classic. The Italian stallion is what yes, I call he him. Is. And uh he's he's just got some great R and B music. And this year we're getting funky on cool. it. Cool. You know, last year we had we had more country artists. Damien played last year as well. Right. But we had a little more country and rock. But this year we're going full on just funky groove. That's cool. We are taking it to a different realm, and uh, which is kind of hard for me because I got this issue with the way that I speak and the way that I sing, and uh, I call it twang. And so when I try to sing other genres, it comes out as just country still. But that's what I call. I've named brand. I'm working on creating a new genre, two of them to be exact. One of them is called flavor twang. <laughs> I love that flavor twang. And the other one's groove grass. Dude, let's fucking go. So if you hear this, if you hear this, just uh no, that's it's copyrighted. So don't try to steal you can't. it. We you, already got you. He's got it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We knew those were hitters up right when we started. That is uh, it's Friday the twenty eighth of uh October here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The twenty eighth, and uh we're gonna be running it down. Also we have pitch meeting, right and which is a spectacular band in town. If y'all haven't made it out to one of the pitch and meeting nights, uh, I really suggest you should, especially if you're you're a up and coming songwriter, and uh, if you don't have much experience playing with a band. Uh, what these guys do is uh, back. Actually, I met them the same time that I met you uh, mm-hmm. at Alley Taps, and uh, and what they do is they bring songwriters up on stage, and they have a group. I mean, it's like a ten piece band of just professional musicians. And they bring up songwriters, and they just learn their song on the spot. 
they've never heard your song before and they play it with you and i did it last week and it was i was nervous getting up there i haven't right. been nervous getting up and playing with a band for a long time and uh I got up there and man, it it's angelic. Like it's the the way that they do it and the way that they bring these songs to life for these songwriters who who may or may not, you know, have a band to play with, but a band of that magnitude right. in, in that degree is just something that very few, even like successful artists, get the opportunity to play with. Right, and uh, so. Me and my buddy, like I, I mean, I'm I knew about pitch meeting and I've been around there and I've played with them and stuff. And you know, this year we were talking about the set list and like who we were gonna try to get. And I was like, man, let me let me call Eric, get him out here. And you know, we were able to you know work it out and get him out there. And I am so excited to have them there. I'm excited to have Damien out there again. I mean, the the songs that they both are gonna bring are just so spectacular now your boy hunter taylor and the favors we're gonna we're gonna close out the night you know i give uh we want pitch meeting to be the center of attention so we're kind of giving them the the middle middle slot slot around like 11 and uh so that by the time that they get done if we take rowdy gets to start i was about to say when we if i take from what we did last year everybody's Kind of in a different headspace by the yep. time twelve o'clock rolls around, and uh, and you know I I was just like a, the pitch meeting they their music deserves to be listened to, you know they deserve to be paid attention to. So does Damien, and then I'm gonna come in there and uh, do what we do best and uh, play for some drunk people. You gonna man. rock out, brother? Yeah, well we're changing it up on them. We're not doing you know I, I always scream about being a honky tonk band. We're not a honky tonk band this time. We adding flavor to it, man. I got me a horn section. When I heard that pitch meeting was bringing a ten piece band, I called up Eric. I told him, I said, "Man, you bringing ten? I'm going after you. I got to bring eleven. <laughs> you know, I got to be the biggest band on the block, baby. I mean, you know, we got to play the game, you know. <laughs> and so, uh, so I'm 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 stepping into new treacherous waters with a with a horn section, and that's gonna uh, be great. Yeah, I got a keys player this time, yeah. and. Uh, so we're doing a lot of different so- songs that I've I've never played before. A little bit of Boogie Shoes. Cool. A little Rubber Necking by yeah. Elvis. You know, Sign Still fun. Delivered. Stevie Wonder. Shout out Stevie yeah. on the wall over there. Yeah, man. And it, it's going to be fun. And it's our third year. I suggest anybody that hears this at least check it out. And uh, That's great. But before you do that, you need to come to the 25th. Dang right. At Tin Roof, because then you'll get to catch Honky Tonk Hunter. Yes, you get to catch Honky Tonk Hunter. You mm-hmm. get to catch Hillbilly Hunter and his That's pines. right. That's right. <laughs> Doing what we do naturally, son. Yep. And then also, we just announced it today. Today, man. We've got you on as the headliner of our show at the basement. Yes, man. sir. I'm very excited for that. You were the headliner on my very ever first sold out show. So thanks cheers to, to the you, buddy. Cheers show. to you, man. Yes, sir. First time Tour Stop ever had a sold out show was uh, Hunter Taylor with uh, Lauren Weintraub, Timothy Miles, and Brandon Ellis, and I've got you framed on my wall up there, man. I got that one in my bedroom. There's Do you a, really? There's a, there's a, I got a, my door to my room and then a closet, and just right between there, there's enough plaster just or to one... fit that bad boy with about an inch on each yep. side, and every morning I get to wake up and walk out my door and see my first sold out show, uh, Right poster, there, man. man. Yeah, and it's it, that was such a monumental moment for me, and uh, I, I thank you for for having us out for that. I hope that we can do it justice like we did la- last time. I think time we're going to do man. it again. That show is December 11th at the basement. Yeah. OG, that's on Eighth Avenue in uh, Nashville. Here, uh, opening for Hunter though, we've got country duo Big Fifty and recently signed to Smack songs mr johnny clausen you know johnny don't you oh yeah johnny was actually one of the first people i met in town before covid right before i started running the town good dude i played with johnny at a chasing melodies round and then you know we've just been homies ever since every time i see him out on the town i go hug his neck tell him how good it is to see him yep we're gonna have ourselves a good old country rock show that night buddy we're gonna bring it i'll make sure that we get new belgium there to buy everybody a bunch of beer come on son (laughs) come on son i love a good cold beer man we do love a good beer okay hunter tell us where the people can find you on the internet 
anywhere you want people to to find your stuff, tell them where they can follow you. Well, on uh, most of the socials, uh, you can either find me under Hunter Taylor or Hillbilly Hunter. Uh, most of the time, it's Hillbilly with two underscores, Hunter. Right. Uh, that's kind of what my shtick is on there. On Spotify, I'm Hunter Taylor. Uh, on SoundCloud, I'm Hunter Taylor. You can check me out on there. I have a few songs I did in college and a <laughs> little little different one that we put out with a little <laughs> bit of flavor on it. You'll probably hear that one at Halloween, a little yeah, Need Your Lovin'. You, uh, you put out a Foot Stomper number nine, didn't you? I did. That, that was my first song. I wrote it with uh, Cindy Morgan. Heck and yeah, uh, that's a honky tonk song. That and, is a honky tonk, and his hillbilly hunter would have it. Yeah, buddy. And I'm proud of that one. I'm glad we got it. It's out. It's a banger, man. Yeah, dude. It's I a love country it. heater. I love it. And uh, I'm hoping we got get some more to come. You were working on, you know, getting in the studio and trying to get those pushed out and getting them in the right area for everybody to listen to and everything like that. We don't want to disappoint. Do it. Yes, sir. Well, guys, thank you so much for listening to this week's episode with Mr. Hunter Taylor. You can check him out on the interwebs, hillbilly underscore underscore Hunter. Absolutely. Or just follow him on Spotify. Listen to Foot Stomper number nine. We'll play that out as the uh, outro music of the episode this week. How about that? That sounds good to me. Hey, thanks for having me out. It's my pleasure, Hunter. Thank you for being here. And uh, you can follow us in Nashville Tour Stop anywhere pretty much at nashville tour stop on your socials please remember to uh, follow and uh, subscribe to our show here share it with your friends every week make sure that you're keeping up with the places we're playing songs we're singing beers we're drinking there is always another one uh, you can follow our live show schedule at nashville tour stop.com we've got an, a whole a whole like events calendar we do 150 200 shows a year so come hang out with me come hang out with hunter if you come hang out on Wednesdays, you can come hang out with Will. <laughs> but guys, thank you for listening this week. Uh, until then, enjoy Foot Stomper number nine by Hunter Taylor. And do remember that all roads lead right back here to the Nashville Tour, Tour Stop. Stop. Yeehaw, motherfucker. Well, some girls too step and fix their lips. Some girls are sweet and never find the beat. Some girls don't dance and pass on their chance way. Oh.